Claire came awake feeling sick, wretched and cold. Someone was pounding on the back of her head with a croquet mallet, or at least that was how it felt. And when she tried to move, the whole world spun around. Shut up and stop moaning, somebody said from a few feet away. Don't you dare throw up or I'll make you eat it. It sounded like Jason Rosser, Eve's crazy brother. Claire swallowed hard and squinted, trying to make out the shadow next to her. Yeah, it looked like Jason. Skanky, greasy, and insane. He tried to, she tried to squirm away from him, but ran into a wall at her back. It felt like wood, but she didn't think it was the glass house attic. He'd taken her somewhere, probably using the portal, and now none of her friends could follow, <clears throat> because none of them knew how. Her hands and feet were tied. Claire blinked, trying to clear her head. This was a little unfortunate, because with clarity came the awareness of just how bad this was. Jason Rosser really was crazy. He'd stalked Eve. He'd at least allegedly killed girls in town. He'd definitely stabbed Shane, and he'd staked Amelia at the feast when she tried to help him. And none of her friends back at Glass House would know how to find her. To their eyes, she would have just... vanished. What do you want? she asked. Her voice sounded rusty and scared. Jason reached out and moved hair back from her face, which creeped her out. She didn't like him touching her. Relax, shortcake. You're not my type, he said. I do what I'm told. That's all. You are wanted. That's why I brought you. Wanted? A low, silky laugh floated on the silence. Dark as smoke, and Jason looked over his shoulder as the hidden observer rose and stepped into what little light there was. Sandra. Bishop's pale little girlfriend. Beautiful, sure. Delicate as jasmine flowers, with big, liquid eyes and a sweetly rounded face. She was poison in a pretty bottle. Well, she said, and crouched down next to Claire. Look at what the cat dragged in. Meow. A sharp nail dragged over Claire's cheek, and judging from the sting, it drew blood. Where's your pretty boyfriend, Miss Claire? I really wasn't done with him, you know. I hadn't even properly started. Claire felt an ugly lurch of anger mixed with her fear already churning her stomach. He's probably not done with you either, she said, and managed to smile. She hoped it was a cold kind of smile, the sort that Amelia used, or Oliver. Maybe you should go looking. I bet he'd be so happy to see you. I'll show the boy a real good time when we do meet up again. Yassandra purred, and put her face very close to Claire's. Now then, let's talk. Just as girls. Won't that be fun? Not. Claire was struggling against the ropes, but Jason had done his job pretty well. She was hurting herself more than accomplishing anything else. Yassandra grabbed Claire's shoulder and wrenched her upright against the wooden wall, hard enough to bang Claire's injured head. For a day second, it looked like Yassandra's ripe red smile floated in midair, like some undead Cheshire cat. Now, Yassandra said, ain't this nice, sweetie? It's too bad we couldn't get Mr. Shane to join us. But my little helper here, he's a bit worried about tackling Shane. Bad blood and all. She laughed softly. Well, we'll make do. Amelia likes you, I hear. And you've got on that pretty little gold bracelet. So you'll do just fine. For what? I ain't telling you, sweetie. Yassandra's smile was truly scary. This town's going to have a wild night, though. Real wild. And you're going to get to see the whole thing up close. You must be all a tingle. Eve would have had a quip at the ready. Claire just glared and wished her head would stop aching and spinning. What had he hit her with? It felt like the front end of a bus. She didn't hadn't thought Jason could hit that hard, truthfully. Don't try to find me, Shane. Don't. The last thing she wanted was Shane racing to the rescue and taking on a guy who'd stabbed him, and a vampire who'd led him, led him around by a leash. No, she had to find her own way out of this. Step one, figure out where she was. Claire left Yassandra to, Yassandra to ramble on, <clears throat> describing all kinds of lurid things that Claire thought it was better not to imagine, considering they were things Yassandra was thinking of doing to her. Instead, she tried to identify her surroundings. It didn't look familiar, but that was no help. She was still relatively new to Morganville, plenty of places she'd never been. 
and wait. Claire focused on the crate that Jason was sitting on. There was stenciling on it. It was hard to make it out in the dim light, but she thought it said Brit's Bulk Coffee. And now that she thought about it, it smelled like coffee in here too. A warm, morning kind of smell, floating over dust and damp wood. And she remembered Eve laughing about how Oliver bought his coffee from a place called Bricks. As in, tastes like ground up bricks, Eve had said. If you ordered flavoured, they had it in the mortar. They were only two coffee shops in town. Oliver's Place and the University City, Cent- City Centre University Centre Coffee Bar. They still like the UC, which wasn't that old and was mostly built of concrete, not wood. That meant she was at Common Grounds? But Common Grounds didn't make any sense. There wasn't any kind of portal leading to it. Maybe Oliver has a warehouse. That sounded right, because the vampires seemed to own a lot of the warehouse districts the, that board had found a square. Brandon, Oliver's second in Vampire Command, had been found dead in the warehouse. Maybe she was close to Founder's Square. Cassandra's cold fingers closed around Claire's chin and jerked it up. Are you listening, honey? Truthfully? No, Claire said. You're kind of boring. Jason actually laughed and turned it into a fake cough. I'm going outside, he said. So this is going to go personal now. Claire wanted to yell him to not to go. But she bit her tongue and turned it into a subsonic whine in the back of her throat as she watched him walk away. His footsteps receded into the dark, and then finally a small square of light opened a long way off. It was a door too far for her to reach. Way too far. I thought he'd never leave, Ysandra said, and put her cold, cold lips on Claire's neck, and then yelled in shock and pulled away, covering her mouth with one pale hand. You bitch! Ysandra hadn't seen the silver chain Claire was wearing in the dim light. As whisper thin as it was, now there was were welts forming on the vampire's full lips, forming, breaking, and bleeding. Fury sparked in Ysandra's eyes. Playtime was over. As Claire squirmed away, the vampire followed a lazy stroll. She wiped her burnt lips and looked at the thin, leaking blood in distaste. Tastes like silver. Disgusting. You just ruined my good mood, little girl. As she rolled, Claire felt something sharp dig into her leg. The knife. They'd found the stake, but she guessed their search hadn't exactly been thorough. Jason was too crazy, and Yasandra was too careless and arrogant. But the knife wasn't going to do her any good at, at all where it was, unless... Yasandra lunged for her, a blur of white in the darkness, and Claire twisted and jammed her hip down at an awkward angle. The knife slipped and tore through the fabric of her jeans. Not much of it, just a couple of inches, but enough to slice open Yasandra's hand and arm as it reached for her all the way to the bone. Yasandra shrieked in real pain and spun away. She didn't look so pretty now, and when she turned towards Claire again, from a respectful distance this time, she hissed her with a full cobra fangs extended. Her eyes were wild and blood red, glowing like rubies. Claire twisted, nearly yanking her elbow out of its joint and managed to get the ropes around her wrist against the knife. She didn't have long, the shock wouldn't keep Yasandra at bay for more than a few seconds, but getting a silver knife to cut through synthetic rope? That was going to take a while. A while she didn't have. Claire saw desperately and got a little bit of give on the bonds, enough to almost get a hand into her pocket, but not. Yasandra gabbed her by the hair. I'm going to destroy you for that. The pain in her head was blinding. It felt like her scalp was being ripped off. And on top of that, the massive headache roared back to a new, sickening pulse. Claire loosened the rope enough to plunge her aching hand into her pocket and grabbed the handle of the knife. She yanked it out of the tangled fabric and held it at a trembling handicap on guard. Still tied up, but whatever. She wasn't going to stop fighting. Not ever. Yasandra shrieked and let her go, which made no sense to Claire's confused, pain-shocked mind. I didn't stab her yet, did I? Not that she wanted to stab anybody, even Yasandra. She just wanted... What was going on? Yasandra's body slammed down hard on the wooden floor, and Claire gasped and flinched away. But the vampire had fallen face down, limp, and weirdly broken. A small woman dressed in grey, her pale hair falling wild around her shoulders, dropped silently from overhead and put one impeccably lovely grey pump in the centre of Yasandra's back. 
holding her down as she tried to move. Claire? The woman's face turned towards her, and Claire blinked twice before she realised whom she was looking at. Amelie. But not Amelie. Not the cool remote founder. The woman had a wild, furious energy to her that Claire had never seen before, and she looked young. I'm okay, she said faintly, and tried to decide whether this version of Amelie was really here, or a function of her smacked around brain. She decided it would be a good idea to get her hands and feet untied before figuring anything else out. That took long minutes, during which Amelie dragged Isandra, whimpering, into the corner and fastened her wrist to a massive crossbeam with chains. The chains, Claire registered, had been there all along. Lovely. This was some kind of vamp playpen or storage locker. Probably Oliver's. And she felt sick again. Thinking about it, Claire soared grimly at the ropes, binding her, and finally parted one complete twist around her hands. As she struggled out of the loose, the loops of rope, she saw deep white imprints in her skin and realised that her hands were red and swollen. She could still feel them, at least, and the burn of circulation returning felt as if she was holding them over an open flame. She focused on slicing the increasingly dulled knife through the rope on her feet, but it was no use. Here, Amelia said, and bent down to snap the rope with one twist of her fingers. It was so frustrating, after all that hard work, to see just how easy it was for her. Claire stripped the ties away and sat for a moment, breathing hard, starting to feel every cut, bump and bruise on her body. Amelia's cool fingers cupped Claire's chin and forced her head up, and the vampire's grey eyes searched hers. You have a head injury, Amelia said. I don't think it's too serious. Headache and some dizziness, perhaps. She let it go. I expected to find you. I don't expect to find you here, I confess. Amelia looked fine. Not a prisoner. Not a scratch on her, in fact. Claire had lots more damage, and she hadn't been dragged off as Bishop's prisoner. Wait, you... We thought Bishop might have got you. But he didn't, did he? Amelia cocked her eyebrow at her. Apparently not. Then where did you go? Claire felt a completely useless urge to lash out at her. Cracked that extreme cool. Why did you do this? You left us alone. And you called the vampires out of hiding. Her voice failed her for a second as she thought about Officer O'Malley and the others she'd heard about. You got some of them killed. Amelia didn't respond to that. She simply stared back, as calm as a nice sculpture. Karma, because she wasn't melting. Tell me why, Claire said. Tell me why you did that. Because plans change, Amelia replied. As Bishop changes his moves, I must change mine. The stakes are too high now, Claire. I've lost half the vampires of Morganville to him. He's taking away my advantage. I needed to draw them to me, for their own safety. You got vampires killed, not just humans. I know humans don't mean anything to you, but I thought the whole point of this was to save your people. And so it is, Amelia said. As many as can be saved. As for the call, there is a thing in chess known as a blitz attack. You see, a distraction. To cover the movement or more Im of more important pieces, you retrieve Mernin and let him in play again. That was most important. I need my most powerful pieces on board. Like Oliver? Claire rubbed her hands together trying to get the annoying tinge out of them. He's hurt, you know. Maybe dying. He served his purpose. Amelia turned her attention towards Yassandra, who was starting to stir. It's time to take Bishop's Rook, I believe. Claire clutched a silver knife, hand in her fist. Is that all I am to you? Some kind of sacrifice pawn? That got Amelia's attention again. No. She said in surprise. Not entirely. I do care, Claire, but in war you can't care too much. It paralyzes your ability to act. Those luminous eyes turned towards Isandra again. It's time for you to go, because I doubt you would enjoy seeing this. You'll be able to re return here. I'm closing down the note on the network. When I'm finished, there'll be only two destinations to me or to Bishop. Where is he? You don't know? Amelia raised her eyebrows again. Here's where it is most secure, of course. At City Hall. And at nightfall, I will come against him. That's why I came looking for you, Claire. I need you to tell Richard. Tell him to get all those who can't fight for me out of the building. But 
He can't. It's a storm shelter. There are supposed to be tornadoes coming. Claire, merely said, listen to me. If innocents, if innocents take refuge in that building, they will be killed. Because I can't protect them anymore. We're at the end game now. There's no room for mercy. She looked again at Yasanji, who had gone very still, listening. Y'all wouldn't be saying that in front of me if I was going to walk out of here, would you? Sandra asked. She sounded calm now, very still. No, I mean said. Very perceptive. I wouldn't. She took Claire by the arm and helped her to her feet. I am relying on you, Claire. Go now. Tell Richard these are my orders. Before Claire could utter another word, she felt the air shimmer in front of her, in the middle of the big warehouse room, and she fell. Out over the dusty trunk in the glasshouse attic, where Oliver had been, she sprawled ungracefully on top of it, then rolled off and got to her feet with a thump. When she waved her hand through the air, looking for that strange heat shimmer of an open portal, she felt nothing at all. I'm closing the portals, Amelia had said. She'd close this one, for sure. Claire? Shane's voice came from the far end of the attic. He shoved aside boxes and jumped over jumbled furniture to reach her. What happened to you? Where did you go? I'll tell you later she said, and realised she was still holding the bloody silver knife. She carefully put it back in her pocket, in the makeshift holster against her leg. It was so dull she didn't think it would cut anything again. But it made her feel better. Oliver? Bad. She put his hands around, around her head and tilted it up, looking at her over. Is everything okay? Define everything. No. Define okay? She shook her head in frustration. I need to get to the radio. I have to talk to Richard. Richard wasn't on the radio. He's meeting with the mayor, said the man who answered. Sullivan. Claire thought his name was. But she hadn't really paid attention. You got a problem there? No, officer. You've got a problem there, she said. I need to talk to Richard. It's really important. Everybody needs to talk to Richard, Sullivan said. He'll get back to you. He's busy right now. If it's not an emergency response... Yes, okay, it's an emergency! Then I'll send units out to you. Class house, right? No, it's not. <sighs> Claire wanted to slam the radio down in frustration. It's not an emergency here. Look, just tell Richard that he needs to clear everybody out of City Hall as soon as possible. <laughs> Can't do that, Sullivan said. It's our centre of operations. It's the main storm shelter, and we've got one heck of a storm coming tonight. You're going to have to give me a reason, miss. All right. It's because... <sighs> Michael took the radio away from her and shut it off. Claire gaped, stuttered, and finally demanded, Why? Because if Claire Emil if, if Amelia says Bishop's got himself installed in City Hall, somebody there has to know. We don't know who's on his team, Michael said. I don't know Sullivan that well, but I know he never was happy with the way things ran in town. I wouldn't put it past him to be buying Bishop's crap about giving the city back to the people. Home rule, all that stuff. Same goes for anybody else there. Except maybe Joe Hess and Travis Lowe. We have to know who we're talking to before we say anything else. Shane nodded. I'm thinking that Sullivan's keeping Richard out of the loop for a reason. They were downstairs, the four of them. Eve, Shane and Claire were at the kitchen table. And Michael was pacing the floor and casting looks at the couch. But Oliver was. The older vampire was asleep, Claire guessed, or unconscious. They'd done what they could. Washed him off and wrapped him in clean blankets. He was healing, according to Michael but he wasn't doing it very fast. When he'd woken up, he'd seemed distant, confused, afraid. Claire had given him one of the doses she'd got from Dr. Mills, and so far, he seemed to be helping. But if Oliver was sick, Mernie's fears were becoming real. Soon, it'd be Amelia too. And then there would they be. So what do we do? Claire asked. Amelia said we have to tell Richard... We have to get non-combatants out of City Hall as soon as possible. Problem is, you heard him giving instructions to the civil defence guys earlier. They're out telling everybody to town to go to City Hall if they can't make it to another shelter. Radio and TV too. Hell, half the town is probably there already. Maybe she won't do it, Eve said. I mean, she wouldn't kill everybody in there, would she? Not even if she thinks they're working for Bishop. I think it's gone past that. Claire said. I don't know if she has any choice. There's always a choice. Not in chess.
Claire replied. Unless your choice is to lay down and die. In the end, the only way to be sure they got to the right person was to get in the car and drive there. Claire was a little shocked at the colour of the sky outside, a solid grey, with clouds moving so fast it was like time lapse on the weather channel. The edges looked faintly green, and in this part of this country, that was never a good sign. The only good thing about it was that Michael didn't have to worry about getting scorched by the sunlight. He brought a hoodie and a blanket to throw over his head just in case, but it was dark outside and getting darker fast. Premature sunset. Drops of rain were smacking the sidewalk the size of half dollars. Where they hit Claire's skin, they felt like paintball pellets. And she looked up at the clouds. A horizontal flash of lightning peeled the sky in half, and thunder rumbled, rumbled so loudly she felt it through the soles of her shoes. Come on, Eve yelled and started the car. Claire ran to open the back seat door and piled in, in beside Shane. Eve was already accelerating before she could fasten her seatbelt. Michael, get the radio. He turned it on, static. As he scanned stations, they got sh ghosts of signals from other towns, but nothing came through clearly in Morganville. Probably because the vampires jammed it. Then one came in, loud and clear, broadcasting on a loop. Attention Morganville residents, this is an urgent public service announcement. The National Weather Service has identified an extremely dangerous storm tracking towards Morganville, which will reach our borders at 6.27 this evening. At its present speed, this storm has already been responsible for devastation in several areas in its path, and there has been significant loss of life due to tornadic activity. Morganville and the surrounding areas are on tornado watch through 10pm this evening. If you hear an alert siren, go immediately to a destination designated safe shelter location or to the safest area of your home if you cannot reach a safe shelter attention Morganville residents michael clicked it off there was no point in listening to the repeat it wasn't going to get any better how many safe shelters are there shane asked university dorms have them do you see founder square has two michael said but nobody can get to them right now they're locked up library and the church Father Joe would open up the basement so that it'll, it'll fit a couple of hundred people. Everybody else would head to City Hall if they didn't stay in their houses. The rain started to fall in earnest, slapping the windshield at first and then pounding it in fierce waves. The ancient windshield wipers really weren't up to it, even at high speed. Claire was glad she wasn't trying to drive. Even in clear visibility, she wasn't very good, and she had no idea how Eve was seeing a thing. If she was, of course, maybe this was faith-based driving. Other cars were on the road, and most of them were heading the same way they were. Claire looked at the clock on her cell phone. 5.30pm. The storm was less than an hour away. Uh-oh, Eve said, and braked as they turned the last corner. It was a sea of red taillights. Over the roll of thunder and pounding rain, Claire heard honks honking. Traffic moved, but slowly. One car at a time inching forward. They're checking cars at the barricade. I can't believe. Something happened up there. And the brake lights began flickering off in steady rows. Cars moved, E fell into line, and the big black sedan rolled past two police cars still flashing their lights in the red, blue, red glow. Claire saw that they'd moved the barricades aside and were just waving everyone through. This is crazy, she said. We can't get people out. Not fast enough. We'd have to stop everybody from coming in first and then give them somewhere else to go. I'm getting out of the car here, Michael said. I can run faster than you can drive in this. I'll get to Richard. They won't dare stop me. That was probably true, but Eve still, still said, Michael, don't. Not that it stopped him from bailing out into the rain. A flash of lightning streaked by overhead and showed him splashing through the thick puddles wave weaving around cars. He was right. He was faster. Eve muttered something about stupid, stubborn, butt-sucking boyfriends and followed the traffic towards City Hall. Out of nowhere, a truck pulled out in front of them from a side street and stopped directly in their path. Eve yelled and hit the brakes, but they were mushy and wet, and not great at the best of times. <clears throat> and Claire felt the car slip and then slide, gathering speed as it went. Glad I put on my seatbelt, she thought, which was a weird thing to think. As Eve's car hydroplaned right into the truck, Shane stretched out his arm to hold her in place. Anyway instinct 
Claire guessed. And then they all got thrown forward hard as physics took over. Physics hurt. Claire rested her aching head against the cool window. It was cracked, but still intact, and tried to shake it off. Jim was unhooking himself from the seatbelt and, and asking her if she was okay. She made some kind of gesture and mumbled something, which she hoped would be good enough. She wasn't up to real reassurance at the moment. Eve's door opened and got dragged out of the car. Hey! Shane yelled and threw himself out his own door. Claire fumbled at the latch, but hers seemed struck, stuck and navigated the push button on her seatbelt and opted for Shane's side of the car instead. As she stumbled out in the shockingly warm rain, she knew they were really in trouble now because the man holding a knife to Eve's throat was Frank Collins. Shane's father and all-around badass, crazy vampire hunter. He looked exactly like she remembered, tough, bike hard, dressed in leather and tattoos. He was yelling something at Eve, something Claire couldn't hear over the crash of thunder. Shane threw himself into a slide over the trunk of the car and grabbed at his dad's knife hand. Dad elbowed him in the face and sent him staggering. Claire grabbed for the silver knife in her jeans, but it was gone. She dropped it somewhere. Before she could look for it, Shane was back in the fight, struggling with his dad. He moved the knife enough that Eve slid free and ran to grab, grab on to Claire. Frank shoved his son down on the hood of the car and raised the knife. He froze there, with rain pouring from his chin like a thin silver beard and off the point of the knife. No! Claire screamed. No, don't hurt him! Where's the vampire? Frank yelled back. Where is Michael Glass? Gone, Shane said. He coughed away, pounding rain. Dad, he's gone. He's not here, Dad. Frank seemed to focus on his son for the first time. Shane? Yeah, Dad, it's me. Let me go, okay? Shane was careful to keep his hands up, palms out in surrender. Peace. It worked. Frank stepped back and lowered the knife. Good, he said. I've been looking for you, boy. And then they hugged him. Shane still had his hands up and froze in place without touching his father. Claire shivered at the look in his face. Yeah. Good to see you too, he said. Oh. He said, <clears throat> back off, man. We're not close, in case you forgot. You're still my son. Blood is blood. Frank pushed him towards the truck, only lightly crushed where Eve's car had smacked him. Get in. Why? Because I said so, Frank shouted. Shane just looked at him. Tell me, boy, for once in your life, do what I tell you. I spent most of my life doing what you told me, Shane said, including selling out my friends. Not happening anymore. Frank's lips parted temporarily amazed. He laughed. <laughs> Don't drunk the suit. Don drunk the suicide cola, didn't you? When he shook his head, drops flew in all directions and were immediately lost in the silver downpour. Just get in. I'm trying to save your life. You don't want to be where you're trying to go. Strangely enough, Frank Gullies was making sense. Probably for all the wrong reasons, though. We have to get through, Claire shouted over the pounding rain. She was shivering soaked through every layer of clothing. It's important. People could die if we don't. People are going to die, Colin agrees. Omelets and eggs, you know the old saying. Or chess, Claire thought. Though she didn't know whose side Frank Collins was playing on, or even if he knew he was being manipulated at all. There's a plan, Frank was saying to his son. In all this crap, nobody's checking faces. Metal detectors are off. We seize control of the building and make things right. We shove these bastards off, once and for all. We can do it. Dad, Shane said. Everybody in that building tonight is going to be killed. We have to get people out, not get them in. If you care anything about those idiots who buy your revolutionary crap, you'll call this off. Call it off, Frank repeated. And uncomprehending as if Shane was speaking over language. When we're this close? When we can win? Damn it, Shane, you used to believe in this. You used to... Yeah, used to. Look it up. Shane shoved his father away from him and walked over to Eve and Claire. I've warned you, Dad. Don't do this. Not today. I won't turn you in, but I'm telling you, if you don't back off, you're dead. I don't talk. Th I don't take threats, Frank said. Not from you. You're an idiot.
Chin said. And I tried. He got back in the car on the passenger side front seat where Michael had been. Eve scrambled behind the wheel and Claire got in the back. Eve reversed. Frank stepped out into the road ahead of them, a scary looking man in black leather with his straggling hair plastered around his face. And and in the big hunting knife and cue the scare. Add in the big hunting knife and cue the scary music. <laughs> Eve let up on the gas. No, Shane said and moved his left foot over to jam it on top of hers. Go. He wants you to stop. I don't. I can't miss him. Nope. But it was too late. Frank was staring into the headlights, squarely in the centre of the hood, and he was getting closer and closer. Frank Collins threw himself out of the way at the, at the last possible second. Eve swerved wildly in the opposite direction to miss him, and somehow they didn't kill Shane's dad. What the hell are you doing? Eve yelled at Shane. Shane was shaking all over. She was shaking all over, and so was Shane. You want to run him over? Do it on your own time! God! Look behind you, Shane whispered. There were people coming after them. A lot of people. They'd been hiding in the alley, Claire guessed. They had guns, and now they opened fire. The car shuddered and the back window exploded into cracks and fell with a crash all over Claire's neck. Get up here, Shane said, and grabbed her hands to haul her into the front seat. Keep your head down. Eve had sunk down on the driver's side, barely keeping her eyes above the dashboard. She was panting hoarsely. Panicked and more gunshots <clears throat> were rattling in the back of the car. Something hit the front window, too, adding more cracks and a round backward splash of a hole. Faster, Shane yelled. Eve hit the gas hard and whipped around a slower moving van. The firing ceased, at least for now. You see why I didn't want you to stop? Okay. Your father's officially off my Christmas list, Eve yelled. Oh my god, look at my car! Shane barked out a laugh. Yeah, he agreed. That's what's important. It's better than thinking about what would have happened, Eve said. If Michael had been with us, Claire thought about the mobs Richard had talked about and that the dead vampires and felt sick. They'd have dragged him off, she said. They'd have killed him. Michael had been right about Shane's dad, but then Claire had never really doubted it. Neither had Shane. From the sick certainty on his face, he wiped his eyes from his forearm, which really didn't help much. They were all dripping wet from head to toe. Let's just get to the building, Shane said. We can't do much until we find Richard. Only it wasn't that simple. Even getting in, the underground parking was crammed full of cars, parked haphazardly at every angle. <clears throat> As Eve inched through the shadows, looking for any place to go, she shook her head. If we do manage to get people to leave, they won't be able to take their cars. Everybody's blocked in, she said. This is massively screwed up. Claire, for her part, thought some of it seemed deliberate, not just panic. Okay. I'm going to put it against the wall and hope we can get out if we need to. The elevator was already locked down. The doors open, but the lights off and buttons are responsive. They took the stairs at a run. The first floor door seemed to be locked until Shane pushed on it harder and then it creaked open against a flood of protests. The vestibule was full of people. Morganville City Hall wasn't all that large, at least not here in the lobby area. There was a big sweeping staircase leading up all grand marble and polished wood, and glass display cases taking up part of one wall. The license bureau was off to the right, six old-time bank windows with bars all closed. <clears throat> Next to each window was a brass plaque that read what the windows were supposed to deliver. Residential licensing, car registration, zoning charge requests, special permits, traffic violations, fine payments, taxes, city services. But not today. The lobby was jammed with people, families mostly, mothers and fathers with kids, some as young as infants. Claire didn't see a single vampire in the crowd, not even Michael. At the far end, a yellow civil defence sign indicated that the door led to a safe shelter, with a tornado graphic next to it. A policeman with a bullhorn was yelling for order, not that he was getting any. People were pushing, shoving and shouting at one another. The shelter is now at maximum capacity, please be calm. Not good. Shane said. There was no sign of Richard, although there were at least ten uniformed police officers trying to manage the crowd. Upstairs? Upstairs, Eve agreed. 
and they squeezed back into the fire stairs and ran up to the next level. The sign in the stairwell said that this that this floor contained the mayor's office, sheriff's office, city council chambers, and something called, vaguely, records. The door was locked. Shane rattled it and banged for entrance, but nobody came to the rescue. Guess we go up, he said. The third floor had no signs in the stairwell at all, but there was a symbol, the founder's glyph, like the one on Claire's bracelet. Shane turned the knob, but again, the door didn't open. I didn't think they could do that to fire stairs, Eve said. Yeah? Call a cop. Shane looked up the stairs. One more floor. And there's just the roof. And I'm thinking that's not a good idea. The roof. Wait. Claire studied the founder's cliff for a few seconds, then shrugged and reached out to turn the knob. Something clicked, and it turned. The door opened. How did you... Claire held up her wrist, and the gold bracelet... It was worth a shot. I thought maybe with the gold bracelet. Genius. Go on, get inside. Shane said, and hustled them in. The door clicked shut behind them, and locked with a snap of metal. The hallway seemed dark, after the fluorescent lights in the stairs, and that and that was because the lights were dimmed way down. The carpet was dark, and so was the wood panelling. It reminded Claire eerily of the hallway where they'd rescued Mernin, only there weren't as many doors opening off, to, off it. Shane took the lead, of course, but the doors they could open were just simple offices, nothing fancy about them at all. And then there was a door at the end of the hall, with the founder's symbol etched on the polished brass doorknob. Shane tried it, shook his head, and motioned for Claire. It opened easily at her touch. Inside were apartments, chambers. Claire didn't know what else to call them. There was an entire complex of rooms leading from one central area. It was like stepping into a whole different world, and Claire could tell that it had been once been beautiful, a beautiful fairy tale room, a rich Satan on the walls. Persian rugs, delicate white and gold furniture. Michael? May Morel? Richard? It was a queen's room, and somebody had completely wrecked it. Most of the furniture was overturned, some kicked to pieces, mirrors smashed, fabrics ripped. Claire froze. Lying on the, re on the remaining long, delicate sofa was Francois, Bishop's over-loyal vampire buddy, who had come to Morganville along with Yassandra as his entourage. The vampire looked completely at ease, legs crossed at the ankles, head propped up on a plump Satan pillow. A big crystal glass of something in dark red rested on his chest. He giggled and saluted them with the blood. Hello, little friends, he said. <clears throat> we weren't expecting you, but you will do. Well, we're almost out of refreshments. Out, Shane said, and shoved Eve towards the door. It slammed shut before she could reach it. And there stood Mr. Bishop, still dressed in his long purple cassock from the feast. It was still torn on the side, where Mernin had slashed him with the knife. There was something so ancient about him, so completely uncaring, that Claire felt her mouth go dry. Where is she? Bishop said. I know you've seen my daughter. I can smell her on you. You, he said, very faintly. So much more than I needed to know. Bishop didn't look away from Claire's face, just pointed at Eve. Silence or be silenced. When I want to know your opinion, I'll consult your entrails. Eve shut up. Francois swung his legs over the edge of the sofa and sat up in one smooth motion. He downed the rest of his glass of blood and let the glass fall, shedding crimson drops all over the pale carpet. He'd got some on his fingers. He licked them, then smeared the rest all over the Satan wall. Please he said, and battled his l battered his long-lashed eye la eye, long eyes at Eve. Please say something. I love entrails. She shrank back against the wall. Even Shane stayed quiet, though Claire could tell he was itching to pull her to safety. You can't protect me, she thought, fiercely. Don't try. You don't know where Amelia is? Claire asked Bishop directly. How's that master plan going, then? Oh, it's going just fine, Bishop said. Oliver is dead, but now Mernin? <laughs> well, we both know that Mernin's insane at best, and on the side that is even better. I'm rather hoping he'll come charging to your rescue and forget who you are once he arrives. That would be amusing, and very typical of him, I'm afraid. Bishop's eyes bored into hers, and Claire felt the net closing round her. Where is Amelie?
where you'll never find her. Fine, let her lurk in the shadows with her creations. Until hunger of the hu all the humans destroy them. This doesn't have to be a battle, you know. It can be a war of attrition, just as easily. I have the high ground. He gestured around, round the ruined apartment with one lazy hand. And of course, I have everyone here. Whether they know it or not. She didn't hear him move, but flinched as Francois trailed cold fingers across the back of her neck, then gripped her tightly. Just like that, Bishop said. Just precisely like that. He nodded to Francois. If you want her, take her. I'm no longer interested in Emilie's pet. <clears throat> take these others too, unless you wish to save them for later. Claire heard Shane whisper. No. And heard the complete despair in his voice just as Bishop's follower wrenched her head over to the side, baring her neck. She felt his lips touch her skin. They burnt like ice. Ah. Francois jerked his head back. You were little peasant. He used a fold of her shirt to take hold of the silver chain around her neck and broke it with a sharp twist. Claire thought the cross in her hand as it fell. Caught the cross in her hand as it fell. May it comfort you. Bishop said and smiled. My child. And then Francois bit her. Claire? Somewhere a long way off, Eve was crying. Oh my God, Claire, can you hear me? Come on, please, please come back. Are you sure she's got a pulse? Yes, she's got a pulse. Claire knew that voice. Richard Morrell. But why was he here? Who called the police? She remembered the accident with the truck. No, that was before. Bishop. Claire slowly opened her eyes. The world felt very far away and safely muffled for the moment. She heard Eve let out a gasp and a flood of words, but Claire didn't try to identify the meaning. I have a pulse. That seemed important. My neck hurts, because a vampire had bitten her. Claire raised her left hand slowly to touch her neck and found a huge wad of what felt like somebody's shirt pressed against her neck. No! Richard said, and forced her hand back down. Don't touch it. It's still closing up. You shouldn't move for another hour or so. Let the wounds close. A bit, Claire murmured. He bit me. That came in a blinding flash like a red knife cutting through the fog. Don't let me turn into one. You won't, Eve said. She was upside down. No, Claire's head was in her lap, and Eve was leaning over her. Claire felt the warm drip of Eve's tears on her face. Oh, sweetie, you're going to be okay, right? Even upside down, Eve's look was panicked as she appealed to Richard, who sat on her right. You'll be all right, he said, and didn't look much better than Claire felt. I have to see to my father here. He moved out of the way, and someone else sat in his place. Shane, his warm fingers closed over hers, and she should when she realised how cold she felt. Eve took an, took an expensive... Velvet blanket over her and around her, fussing nervously. Shane didn't say anything. He was so quiet. <sighs> My cross, Claire said. It had been in her hand. She didn't know where it was now. He broke the chain. I'm sorry. Shane opened his fingers and tipped the cross and chain into her hand. I picked it up, he said. Figured you might want it. There was something he wasn't saying. Claire looked to Eve to find out what it was. But she wasn't talking for a change. Anyway, you are going to be okay. We're lucky this time. Francois wasn't that hungry. He closed her fingers around the cross and held on. His hands were shaking. Shane? I'm sorry, he whispered. I couldn't move. I just stood there. No, he didn't, Eve said. He knocked Franny clear across the room and he would have staked him with the chair leg. Except Bishop stepped in. That sounded like Shane. You're not hurt? Claire asked. Not much, he frowned. Well, not much, Claire, uh, Shane repeated. I'm okay, Claire. She kind of had to take that at face value, at least right now. What time? 6.15, Richard said, from the far corner of the small room. This, Claire guessed, had been some kind of dressing area for Amelie. She saw a long closet to the side. Most of the clothes were shredded and scattered in piles on the floor. The dressing table was a ruin, and every mirror was broken. Francois had had his fun in here, too. <clears throat> the storm was heading for us, Eve said. Michael never got to Richard, but he got to Joe Hess, apparently. 
They evacuated the shelters. Bishop was pretty mad about that. He wants a lot of hostages between him and Amelie. So, all that's left is us. Us and Bishop's people. We didn't leave. And fabulous Frank Collins and his wild bunch who rolled into the lobby and now think they've won some kind of battle or something. Eve rolled her eyes and for an instant was back to her old self. Just us and the bad guys. Did that make Richard? No. Claire couldn't believe that. If anyone in Morganville had honestly tried to do the right thing, it was Richard Morrell. He followed Claire's look. Oh, yeah. His dad got hurt trying to stop Bishop from taking him, taking over from, uh, taking over downstairs. Richard's been trying to take care of him and his mom. We were right about Sullivan, by the way. Total backstabber. Yay for premonitions. Wish I'd run out now that could help us get out of this. No way out, Claire said. Leave the window, Eve said. We're locked in here. No idea where Bishop and his little little sock monkey got off to. Looking for Amelia, I guess. I wish they'd just kill each other already. Eve didn't mean it. Not really. But Claire understood how she felt. Distantly. In a detached, shocked kind of way. What's happening outside? Not a clue. No radios in here. They took our cell phones. Where? The lights blinked and failed putting in the room into the pitch darkness. Screwed. He finished. Oh man, I should not have said that, should I? Power's gone out in the whole building, I think, Richard said. It's probably the storm. All vampires screamed with them, just because they could. Claire didn't say it out loud, but she thought it pretty hard. Shane's hand kept holding hers. Shane? Right here, he said. Stay still. I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry. What for? I shouldn't have got angry with you before about your dad not important he said very softly it's okay claire just rest rest she couldn't rest reality was pushing back in reminding her of pain of fear and most important of time there was an eerie ghostly sound now wailing and getting louder what is that eve asked and then before anybody could answer did so herself Tornado sirens. There's one on the roof. The rising, falling wheel got louder, but with it came something else. A sound like water rushing, or... We need to get to cover, Richard said. A flashlight snapped on and played over Eve's pallid face, then Shane's and Claire's. You guys get over here. This is the strongest interior corner. That said, that side faces out towards the street. Claire tried to get up, but Shane scooped her in his arms and carried her. He sat her down with her back against the wall, and then got under the blanket next to her, with Eve on his other side. The flashlight turned away from them, and in its sweep, Claire caught sight of Mayor Morell. He was a fat man, with a politician's smooth face and smile, but he didn't look anything like she remembered now. He seemed older, shrunken inside this suit, and very ill. What's wrong with him? Claire whispered. Shane's answer stirred the damp hair around her face. Heart attack, he said. At least, that's Richard's best guess. Looks bad. It really did. The mayor was propped against the wall a few feet from them, and he was gasping for breath at his wife. Clara had never seen her before except in pictures. He patted his arm and murmured in his ear. His face was ash grey and lips turning blue, and there was real panic in his eyes. Richard returned, dragging another thick blanket and some pillows. Everybody cover up, he said. Keep your heads down. He covered his mother and father and crouched next to them as he wrapped himself in another blanket. The wind outside was building into a howl. Claire could hear things hitting the walls, dull thudding sounds like baseballs. It got louder. Debris, Richard said. He focused the light on the carpet between their small group. Maybe hail. There could be anything. The siren cut off abruptly, but that didn't mean the noise subsided. If anything, it got louder, ratting up from the howl to a scream, and then it took on a deeper tone. That sounds like a train, Eve said shakily. Dan was really hoping that wasn't true, the train thing. Heads down, Richard yelled. As the whole building started to shake, 
Claire could feel the boards vibrating underneath her. She could see the walls bending and cracks forming in the bricks. And then the noise rose to a constant, deafening scream. And the whole outside wall sagged, dissolved into bricks and broken wood, and disappeared. The ripped, torn fabric around the room took flight like startled birds, whip whipping wildly through the air. and getting shredded into ever smaller sections by the white wind and debris. The storm was screaming as if it had gone insane. Broken furniture and shards of mirrors flew around, smashing into the walls, hitting the blankets. Claire heard a heavy groan even over the shrieking wind, and looked up to see the roof sagging overhead. Dust and plaster cascaded down, and she grabbed Shane hard. The roof came down on top of them. Claire didn't know how long it lasted, it seemed like forever, really. The screaming, the shaking, the pressure of things on top of her. And then, very gradually, it stopped. And the rain began to hammer down again, drenching the pile of dust and wood. Some of it trickled down to drip on her cheek, which was how she knew. Shane's hand moved on her shoulder, more of a twitch than a conscious motion. And then he let go of Claire to heave up with both hands. Debris slid and rattled. They'd been lucky, Claire realised. A heavy wooden beam had collapsed over their heads at a slant, and it had held the worst of the stuff off them. Eve? Claire reached across Shane and grabbed her, her friend's hands. Eve's eyes was closed, and there was blood trickling down one side of her face. Her face was even whiter than usual. Plaster dust, Claire realised. Eve coughed and her eyelids fluttered, op fluttered up. Mom? The uncertainty in her voice made Claire want to cry. God, what happened, Claire? We're alive, Shane said. He sounded kind of surprised. He brushed fallen chunks of wood and plaster off Claire's head, and she coughed too. The rain pounded in at an angle, soaking the blanket that covered them. Richard? Over here, Richard said. Dad? Dad! The flashlight was gone, rolled off or buried or just plain taken away by the wind. Lightning flashed bright as day and Claire saw the tornado that had hit them still moving through Morganville, crashing through buildings, spraying debris a hundred feet into the air. It didn't even look real. Shane helped move a beam off Eve's leg. Thankfully, they were just bruised, not broken, and crawled across the slipping wreckage towards Richard, who was lifting things off of his mother. She looked okay, but she was crying and dazed. His father, though. No, Richard said, and dragged his father flat. He started administering CPR. There were bloody cuts on his face, and he didn't seem to care about his own problems at all. Shane? Brief for him. After hesitation, Shane tilted the mayor's head back. Like this? Let me, Eve said. I've had CPR training. She crawled over and took in a deep breath, bent and blew into the mayor's mouth, watching for his chest to rise. It seemed to take a lot of effort. So did what Richard was doing. Pumping on his dad's chest, over and over. Eve counted slowly, then breathed again. And again. I'll get help, Claire said. She wasn't sure that was there was any help, really, but she had to do something. When she stood up, though, she felt dizzy and weak. I remembered what Richard had said. She had holes in her neck, and she had lost a lot of blood. I'll go slow. I'll go with you, Shane said. But Richard grabbed him and pulled him down. No! I need you to take over here. <clears throat> He showed Shane how to place his hands and got him started. He pulled the walkie-talkie from his belt and tossed it to Claire. Go, we need paramedics. And then Richard collapsed, and Claire realised that he had a huge piece of metal in his side. She stood there, frozen in horror, and then punched in the code for the walkie-talkie. Hello? Hello? Is anybody there? Static. If there was anybody, she couldn't hear them over the interference, and the roaring rain. <clears throat> I have to go. She shouted at Shane. He looked up. No! But he couldn't stop her, not without letting the mayor die. Another one helpless, furious look at her, and he went back to work. Claire slid over the pile of debris and scrambled out the broken door, into the main apartment. There was no sign of Francois or Bishop. If the place had been wrecked before, it was unrecognisable. Now, most of this part of the building was gone. Just gone. She felt the floor groan underneath her, and moved fast heading for the apartment's front door. It was still on its hinges, but as she pulled on it, a part of the frame came out of the wall, outside. The hallway seemed eerily unmarked, 
except that the roof overhead, and Claire presumed all the next floor above, was missing. It was a hallway open to the storm. She hurried along it, glad now for the flash of lightning that lit her way. The fire stairs at the end seemed intact. She passed some people huddled there, clearly terrified. We need help, she said. The people upstairs. Hurt. Somebody? And then he, then the screaming started. Somewhere about a floor down, lots of people screaming at the same time. Those who were sitting on the stairs jumped to their feet and ran up towards Claire. No, she yelled. She yelled. No, you can't. But she was shoved out of the way and about 50 people trampled past her, heading up. She had no idea where they'd go. Worse, she was afraid their combined weight would collapse that part of the building, including the place where Eve, Shane and the Morels were. Claire? Michael. He came out of the first floor door and leapt two flights of stairs in about two jumps to reach her. Before he could protest, before she could protest, he grabbed her in his arms like an invalid. Come on, I have to get you out of here. No. No, go up. Shane, they need help. Go up. Leave me here. I can't. He looked down and so did she. Vampires poured into the stairwell below. Some of them were fighting, ripping at one another. Any human who got between them went down screaming. Right, up it is, he said, and she felt them leave the ground in one powerful leap, hitting the third floor landing with cat-like grace. What's happening? Claire twisted to try and look down, but it didn't make any sense to her. It was just a mob fighting one another. No one, no telling what, who was on which side, or even why they were fighting so furiously. Amelie's down there, Michael said. Basically trying to get her, but he's losing followers fast. She took him by surprise, during the storm. What about the people? I mean, the humans. Shane's dad and ones who want to take over. Michael kicked open the door to the third floor, roofless hallway. The people who'd run past Claire were, were milling around, around in it, frightened and babbling. Michael brought down his fangs and snarled at them, and they scattered into whatever shelter they could reach. Interior officers, mostly, that had sustained little damage except for the rain. She should pass those who had nowhere to go, and down to the end of the hall, in here? He let Claire slide down to her feet, and his gaze focused on her neck. Someone bit you. It's not so bad. Claire put a hand over the wound, trying to cover it up. The wound's edges felt ragged, and they were still leaking blood. She thought, although that could have just been the rain. I'm okay. No, you're not. A gust of wind blew his collar back, and she saw the white outlines of marks on his own neck. Michael, did you get bitten too? Like you said, it's nothing. Look, we can talk about that later. Let's get to our friends. First aid, later. Claire opened the door and stepped through, and the floor collapsed underneath her. She must have screamed, but all she heard was the tremendous cracking sound of more of the building falling apart underneath and around her. She turned towards Michael, who was frozen in the doorway, illuminated in stark white by a nearby lightning strike. He reached out and grabbed her arm as she flung it towards him, and then she was suspended in midair, wind and dust rushing up around her. As the floor underneath fell away, Michael pulled and she almost flew, weightless, into his arms. Oh, she whispered faintly. Thanks. He held on to her for a minute without speaking, then said, Is there another way in? I don't know. They backed up and found the next office to the left, which had suspicious-looking cracks in its walls. Claire thought the floor felt a little unsteady. Michael pushed her back behind him and said, Cover your eyes. Then he began ripping away the wall between the office and Amelia's apartments. When he hit solid red brick, he punched it, breaking it into dust. This isn't helping keep things together, Claire yelled. I know, but we need to get them out. He ripped a hole in the wall big enough to step through and braced himself in it as the whole building seemed to shudder, as if shifting its weight. The floor's all right here, he said. You stay, I'll go. For that door, to the left. Claire called. Michael disappeared, moving fast and gracefully. She wondered, all of a sudden, why he wasn't downstairs, why he wasn't fighting like all the others of Amelia's blood. A couple of tense minutes passed, and she stared through the hall. Nothing seemed to be happening. She couldn't hear Michael, or Shane, or anything else. And then she heard screaming behind her, 
in the hall. Vampires, she thought, and quickly opened the door to look. Someone fell against the wood, knocking her backward. <clears throat> it was Francois. Claire tried to shut the door, but a blood-stained white hand wormed through the opening and grabbed the edge, shoving it wider. Francois didn't even look remotely human anymore, but he did look absolutely desperate, willing to do anything to survive, and very, very angry. Claire backed up slowly until she was standing with her back against the far wall. There wasn't much in here to help her. A desk, some pens, and pencils in a cup. Francois laughed and then he growled. You think you're winning, he said. You're not. I think you're the one who's, who has to worry, Marco said from the hole in the wall. He stepped through, carrying May and Morel in his arms. Shane and Eve were with him, supporting Richard's sagging body between them. Mrs. Morell brought up the rear. Back off. I won't come after you if you run. Francois's eyes turned ruby and he threw himself at Michael, who was burdened with the mayor. Claire grabbed a pencil from the cup and plunged it into Francois's back. He whirled, look, looking stunned, and then he slowly collapsed to the carpet. That won't kill him, Michael said. I don't care, Eve said, because that was fierce. Claire grabbed the vampire's arms and dragged him out of the way, careful not to dislodge the pencil. She wasn't really sure how deep it had gone. And if it slipped out of his heart, they were all in big trouble. Michael edged around, around him and opened the door to the check the corridor. Clear, he said. For the moment, anyway. Come on. The little refugee group hurried into the rainy hall, squishing through soggy carpet. There were people hiding in the offices. Or just pressed against the walls and hoping not to be noticed. Come on, he said to them. Get up. We're getting out of here before this whole thing comes down. The fighting in the stairwell was going on. Snarling, screams, bangs and thuds. Claire didn't dare look over the railing. Michael led them down to the locked second floor entrance. He pulled hard on it and the knob popped off. But the door stayed locked. Hey, Mike? Shane had edged, edged uh, to the end of the landing and looked over the railing. Can't go that way. I know! Also, time is... I know, Shane! Michael started kicking the door, but it was reinforced, stronger than the other doors Claire had seen. It bent, but didn't open. And then it did open, from the inside. There, in his fancy but battered black velvet, stood Mernin. In, he said. This way, hurry. The falling sensation warned Claire that the door was a portal, but she didn't have time to tell anybody else. So when they stepped through into Mernin's lab, it was probably kind of a shock. Michael didn't pause. He pushed a bunch of broken glassware from a lab table and put M Mr. Morell down on it, then touched pale fingers to the man's throat. When he found nothing, he started CPR again. Eve hurried over to breathe for him. Mernin didn't move as the refugee steam streamed in past him. He was standing with his arms folded. A frown grew between his brows. Who are all these people? he asked. I'm not an innkeeper, you know. Shut up, Claire said. She didn't have any patience with Mernin right now. Is he okay? She was talking to Shane, who was easing Richard into a threadbare rug near, near the far wall. You mean except for the big piece of metal in him? Look, I don't know. He's breathing, at least. The rest of the refugees clustered together, filtering slowly through the portal. Most of them had no idea what had just happened, which was good. If they'd been part of Frank's group intending to take over Morganville, that ambition was long gone now. They were just people, and they were just scared. Up the stairs, Claire told them. You can get out that way. Most of them rushed for the exit. She hoped they'd make it home, or at least in some kind of safe place. She hoped they had homes to go back to. Burning glared at her. You do realise that this was a secret laboratory, don't you? And now half of Morganville knows where it is. Hey, I didn't open the door. You did. She reached over and put her hand on his arm, looking up into his face. Thank you. We saved our lives. He blinked slowly. Did I? I know why you weren't fighting, Claire said. The drugs kept you from having to... But Michael... Mernie followed her gaze to where Eve and Michael remained and bent over the mayor's still form. I may let him go, he said, for now. She could claim him again at any time, but I think that she knew you needed help. 
He uncrossed his arms and walked over to Michael to touch his shoulder. It's no use, I said, he said. I can smell death in him, so can you. If you try, you won't bring him back. No, Mrs. Morell screamed and threw herself over her husband's body. No, you have to try. They did, Mernie said and retreated to lean against a convenient wall, which is more than I would have. He nodded towards Richard. He might live, but to remove that metal will require a... A chirurgian? You mean a doctor? Claire asked. Yes, of course a doctor. Mine snapped and his eyes flared red. I know you want me to feel some sympathy for them, but that is not who I am. I care only about those I know, and even then, not all that deeply. Strangers got nothing from me. He was slipping, and the anger was coming back. Next, it would be confusion. Claire silently dug in her pocket. She put a single glass vial in, and miraculously, it was still unbroken. He slapped it out of her hand impatiently. I don't need it! Claire watched it clatter to the floor, hardened her mouth, and said, You do. You know you do. Please, Mernin. I don't need your crap right now. Just take your medicine. She didn't think he would. Not at first. But then he snorted, bent down and picked up the vial. He broke the cap off and dumped the liquid into his mouth. There, he said. Satisfied? He shattered the glass in his fingers and the red glow in his eyes intensified. Are you, little Claire? Do, do, did you enjoy giving me orders? Mernin? His hand went around her throat, choking off whatever she was going to say. She didn't move. His, his hand ha didn't tighten. The red glow slowly faded away, replaced by a look of shame. He let go of her and backed away a full step. Head down. I don't know where to have doctor, Claire said, as if nothing had happened. The hospitals, maybe, or... No, Mernie murmured. I will bring help. Don't let anyone go through my things. I watch Michael, in case. She nodded. Mernin opened the portal doorway in the wall and stepped through it, heading. Where? She had no idea. Emily had, Claire thought, shut down all the notes. But if that was true, how would they have got here? Mernie could open and close them at will, but he was probably the only one who could. Michael and Eve moved away from May and Morel's body as his wife stood over him and cried. What can we do? Shane asked. He sounded miserable, and all the confusion he'd missed her confrontation with Mernin, which was... She was dimly glad about that. Nothing, Michael said. Nothing but wait. When the portal opened again, Mernin stepped through, then helped someone else over the step. It was Theo Goldman, carrying an antique doctor's bag. He looked around the lab, nodding to Claire in particular, and then moved to where Richard was lying on the carpet, with his head in his mother's lap. Move back, please, he told her, and knelt down to open his bag. Mernin, take her in the other room. A mother shouldn't see this. He was setting out instruments, unrolling them in a clean white towel. As Claire watched, Mernin led Mrs. Morell away and seated her in a chair in the corner where he normally sat to read. She seemed dazed now, probably in shock. The chair was intact. It was just about the only thing in the lab that was. The scientific instruments were smashed, lab tables overturned, candles and lamps broken. Books were piled in the corners and burnt, reduced to scraps of leather and curling black ash. The whole place smelt sharply of chemicals and fire. What can we do? Michael asked. Crouching down on Richard's other side, Theo took out several pairs of latex gloves and passed one set to Michael. He donned one himself. You can act as my nurse, my friend, he said. I would have brought my wife. She has many years of training in this. But I don't want to leave my children on their own. They're already very frightened. But they're safe? Eve asked. Nobody's bothered you? No one has so much as knocked on the door, he said. It's a very good hiding place. Thank you. I think you're paying us back, Eve said. Please, can you save him? It's in God's hands, not mine. Still, Theo's eyes were bright as he looked at the twisted metal plate embedded in Richard's side. It's good that he's unconscious, but he might wait during the procedure. There is chloroform in the bag. It's Michael, yes? Michael, please put some on a cloth and be ready when I tell you to cover his mouth and nose. 
Claire's nerve failed around the time that Theo took hold of the piece of steel and he, she turned away. Eve already had to take a blanket to Miss Morell and put it around her shoulders. Where's my daughter? The mayor's wife asked. Monica should be here. I don't want her out there alone. Eve raised her eyebrows at Claire, clearly wondering where Monica was. The last time I saw her, she was at school, Claire said. But that was before I got the call to come home, so I don't know. Maybe she's in the shelter in the dorm? She checked her cell phone. No bars. Reception was usually spotted down here in the lab, but she could usually see something, even if it was only a flicker. I think the cell towers are down. Yeah, likely. Eve agreed. She reached over to the to tuck the blanket around Mrs. Morell, who learnt who lent her head back and closed her eyes, as if the strength was just leaking right out of her. You think this is the right thing to do? I mean, do we even know this guy or anything? Claire didn't, really, but she still wanted to She still wanted to like Theo. In much of the same way she as she liked Mernin, against her better sense. I think he's okay. And it's not like anybody's making house calls right now. The operation, and it was an operation, with suturing and everything, took a couple of hours before Theo sat back, stripped off the gloves, and sighed in quiet satisfaction. There, he said. Claire and Eve got to walk over as Michael rose to his feet. Shane had been hanging on the edges, watching in what Claire thought looked like queasy fascination. His pulse is steady. He's lost some blood but I believe he will be alright, provided no infection sets in. Still, this century has those wonderful antibiotics, yes? So, that is not so bad. Theo was also almost beaming. I must say, I haven't used my surgical skills in years. It's very exciting, although it makes me hungry. Claire was pretty sure Richard wouldn't want to know that. She knew she wouldn't have in his place. Thank you, Mrs. Morell said. She got up from the chair, followed the blanket and put it aside, then walked over to shake Theo's hand with simple, dignified gratitude. I'll see that my husband compensates you for your kindness. They all exchanged looks. Michael started to speak, but Theo shook his head. Well, That's quite all right, dear lady. I'm delighted to help. I recently lost my son myself. I know the weight of grief. Oh, Mrs. Morell said. I'm so sorry for your loss, sir. She said if she didn't know her husband was lying across the room, dead. Teal sparkled in his eyes, Claire saw, but then he blinked them away and, and smiled. He patted her hand greatly. You are very generous to an old man, he said. We have always liked living in Morganville, you know. The people are so kind, Shane said. Some of those same people killed your son. Theo looked at him with calm, unflinching eyes. And without forgiveness, there is never any peace. I tell you this from the dis distance of many centuries. My son gave his life. I won't reply. I won't reply to his gift with anger, not even for those who took him from me. Those same poor, sad people will make wake up tomorrow, grieving their own losses. I think, if they survive at all, how can hating them heal me? Many who hadn't spoken at all murmured, "You shame me, Theo." I don't mean to do so he said, and shrugged. Well, I should get back to my family now. I wish you all well. Mernin got up from his chair and walked with Theo to the portal. They all watched him go. Miss Morell was staring after him with a bright, odd look in her eyes. How very strange, she said. I wish Mr Morell had been available to meet him. She spoke as if he were in a meeting downtown instead of under a sheet on the other side of the room. Claire shuddered. Come on. Let's go see Richard, Eve said, and led her away. Shane let out his breath in a slow hiss. Which were as simple as Theo thinks it is, to stop hating. He swallowed watching Miss Morell. I wish I could. I really do. At least you want to, Michael said. It's a start. They stayed the night in the lab, mainly because the storm continued outside. Until the wee hours of the morning. Rain, mostly, with some hail. There didn't seem to be much point running out in it. Claire buried in piles of junk at the back of the room, and they checked for news at regular intervals. Around 3 a.m. they got some. It was on the radio's emergency alert frequency. Organ, 
all Morganville residents and surrounding areas. We remain under severe thunderstorm warnings, with high winds and possible flooding, until 7am today. Rescue efforts are underway at City Hall, which was par- par- partially destroyed by a tornado that also levelled several warehouses and abandoned buildings, as well as the buildings in Founders Square. There are numerous reports of injuries coming in. Please remain calm. Emergency, te- emergency teams are working their way through town now, looking for anyone who may be in need of assistance. Stay where you are. Please don't attempt to go out into the streets at this time. He started to repeat. Eve frowned and looked up at Mernin, who had listened as well. What aren't they saying? She said. If you had to guess, the urgent desire that people stay within shelter would tell me there are other things to worry about. His dark eyes grew distant for a moment and then snapped back into focus. I bid nothing. What? Eve seemed to think she'd misheard. I bid nothing, Carlo. I don't trust this. Mernin was making word salad again, a precursor of the drugs wearing off, more quickly than Claire had expected, actually, and that was worrying. Eve sent Claire a look of alarm. Okay, I didn't really understand that at all. Claire put a hand on her arm to silence her. Why don't you go see Mrs. Morell? You too, Shane. He didn't like it, but he went. As he did, he jerked his head at Michael, who rose from where he was, sitting with Richard and strolled over, casually. Mernin, Claire said. You need to listen to me, okay? I think your drugs are wearing off again. I'm fine. His excitement level was rising. She could see it. A very light flush in his face, his eyes starting to glitter. He worry over notebook. There was no point in trying to explain the signs. He never could identify them. We should check on the prison. We should check on the prison, she said. See if everything's still okay there? Mernin smiled. You're trying to trick me. His eyes were getting darker, endlessly dark, and that smile has edges to it. Oh, little girl, you don't know. You don't know what it's like having all these guests here and all this. He breathed in deeply. All this blood. His eyes focused on her throat, with its ragged bite mark hidden under a bandage Theo had given her. I know it's there. Your mark. Tell me. Did Francois... Stop. Stop it. Claire dug her fingers into her palms. Merlin took a step towards her, and she forced herself not to flinch. She knew him, knew what he was trying to do. You won't hurt me. You need me. Do I? He breathed deeply again. Yes, I do. Bright. So bright. I can feel your energy. I know how it it would feel when I... He blinked and horror sheeted across his face, fast as lightning. What was I saying? Claire? What did I just say? She couldn't repeat it. Nothing, don't worry. But I think we'd better get you to the cell, okay? Please? He looked devastated. This was the worst part of it, she thought. The mood swings. He tried so hard and he'd helped. He really had. But he wasn't going to be able to hold it together much longer. She was seeing him fall apart in slow motion. Again. Michael steered him towards the portal. Let's go, he said. Claire, can you do this? If he doesn't fight me, she said nervously. She remembered one afternoon when his paranoia had taken over, and every time she tried to establish the portal, he snapped the connection. Sure, something was waiting on the other side to destroy him. I wish we had a tranquilizer. Well, you don't, Vernon said. I don't like being stuck with your needles. You know that. I'll behave myself. He laughed softly. Mostly. Claire opened the door, but instead of the connection snapping clear to the prison, she felt it shift, pulled out of focus. Mernin, stop it. He spread his hands theoretically. I didn't do anything. She tried again. The connection bent, and before she could bring it uh, bring it back to where she wanted it, an alternate destination came into focus. Theo Goldman fell at the door. Theo! Mernin caught him, surprised out of his petulance, 
at least for the moment, he eased the vampire down in sitting position against the wall. Are you injured? No, no, no. Theo was gasping, though. Claire knew he didn't need air. Not the way humans did. This was emotion, not exertion. Please, you have to help. I beg you. Help us. Help my family. Please. Merlin crouched down to put their eyes on level. What's happened? Theo's eyes filled with tears that flowed over his, over his lined, kind face. Bishop, he said. Bishop has my family. He says he wants Mealy. And the book. Or he will kill them all. Hello everyone, thank you for listening to the um, the audio file or audio reading I've done of a Rachel Kane book. Um, I'm putting this in there, so if you want to skip past this bit and move on to the next video, that's fine by me. This is just like a cancer plug, because I want to do this, as well as also I have to do this, because the thing you've just listened to is illegal for me to do, without having a charity case behind it which is feel i don't want it to be like a situation like oh i'm only doing this for the sake of cancer which i'm actually doing this for the sake of cancer but i did cancel this series a long long time ago it came to my recent attention that i should redo this in a better format and i feel like now is a perfect opportunity to actually restart this in the worst possible way back in in first of november back in 2020 rachel kane sadly passed away to a rare bone cancer called sarcoma now, in the description below is going to be a link that you can... It's going to be a link so you can support the um, research into helping people survive and defeat sarcoma bone cancer and soft tissue cancer cells and all that stuff. So that's just going to be in the description right there down below. It is in pounds for those American ones, but obviously PayPal and all the research still goes to the same thing because once it's being cured, once they found a cure for it or found an easier solution for it and stuff like that it does get sent around all around the world because everyone works on the same thing all over the world it's just that this charity is based in uk i live in the uk so it still goes to the same goal to beat sarcoma for a long time and i feel like this is the best opportunity to work with it for any rachel king books that we do during the morganville series or any future series that we do obviously this is even going to be in the future series if we do do them so any book that we do by Rachel Kane is going to have this at the end just to plug a little bit of a cancer support for people with sarcoma because it is a rare, rare cancer and there is not a very good survival rate. So just putting that in there to help people or to support the issues that are out there because I'm not going to get any money from these videos at all, even in like the present one. I'm not getting any money of this recording or in the future, if possibly I do. But this is not what I'm about. This is all about for for what Rachel Kane succumbed to in the end. So hopefully that as a team together we can beat sarcoma and end one of the cancers that are killing people. Because no one likes that. But anyway, have a good day.